Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I think uh, that along perhaps with the release of Nelson Mandela, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, there's two events where I think life-changing uh, moments for my generation, uh, wherever we were in the world, uh, when they were happening. And uh, to be here 20 years on and able to contribute to these discussions is a particular honour and a pleasure. In 1989, I was still a school teacher. I was teaching maths in a, uh, a deprived community in, in, in Scotland and in the early stages of uh, elected politics. And uh, thinking about that uh, as I was coming over from, from Scotland this morning uh, reminded me of, a, of perhaps just about the funniest thing that happened to me when I was uh, First Minister of, of Scotland. It happened in a school shortly before the election in, in 2007. And I, we were opening a brand new school on the outskirts of uh, the city of Glasgow. And uh, as ever on these occasions, the school looked absolutely perfect. The pupils, the students, the teachers, the parents who were there for the day, the other members of staff were all looking at their very best. The speeches had gone well, there was some music, and the new school looked like a fantastic building that was going to be a, a great resource for the community. And I thought this must be just about the most perfect school in Scotland. But as a former teacher, I should have known better. And uh, after the ceremony was finished, I uh, went to the head teacher's room to do a radio interview, much like I think I'm going to do after this speech today. And uh, the, outside the head teacher's room, I don't know if this is the case in every country represented in this room, uh, but certainly in Scotland this is almost always true. There is one little boy sitting outside the head teacher's room on a seat, uh, waiting for the head teacher to return. And I couldn't resist, as a former school teacher, stopping to talk to him. And perhaps if I'm being honest, showing off a little to those who were with me. And I stopped and said, why are you sitting there? And he mumbled something into his chest, which I couldn't quite hear. Uh, so I pressed the point and said, have you been in trouble today? And he said, yes, I'm, I'm very sorry. I have been in trouble this morning, very sorry. And I thought, right, I am not a school teacher anymore. I am the First Minister of Scotland. What can I say? that might have an impact on his behaviour for the rest of the day. Uh, so, uh, without really thinking through what might happen next, I said, do you realise that I am in charge of all of the prisons in Scotland? <laughs> <laughs> and this little boy had a flicker of recognition and friendship in his eye as he looked up to me and said, you will have met my big brother then. <laughs> I just, hope, I just hope we didn't follow in his big brother's footsteps. <laughs> Today I want to, uh, I want to talk uh, as briefly as possible to give a chance for questions and answers uh, uh, about the importance of conflict uh, in, in the widest sense, the importance of conflict prevention, but in particular about stabilisation and peace building and post-conflict reconstruction. I, I'll, I'll talk uh, probably primarily about Africa because that is... Uh, uh, where I am most engaged at the moment, uh, but uh, I think much of what I have to say has a much wider relevance than that. Um, it's clear that 20 years ago, uh, this weekend, uh, an entire world order changed and lives were changed. I don't believe they were just changed in Eastern Europe, uh, or even for that matter across Europe, as the European Union then expanded and new friendships were developed that I think benefited the whole continent. I'm absolutely certain that the events here 20 years ago that weekend have led on to uh, the, uh, many of the improvements in the quality of life for people who live, for example, in the Republic of China or in uh, Latin America uh, or, for that matter, in Africa. It's perhaps a salient point that the first uh, elected leader in Africa to give up office having lost an election voluntarily uh, was in Benin in 1991, and only two years after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, up until that point, in 30 or so years of uh, independence for most African states, uh, elected leaders had not voluntarily lost elections and given up office. 
And I think the mood for democracy and change that uh, uh, in many ways, in our television screens at least, uh, was personified by what happened this weekend in Berlin 20 years ago, uh, had an impact obviously far, far beyond Europe. But it also unleashed a world that was more uncertain because the world order had changed. And we saw obviously in the 1990s, uh, genocide in Africa and in Europe. Uh, we saw civil wars and tensions uh, erupt across the globe that perhaps had been contained in the past by the great divide between the two power blocks that dominated the world order before 1989. And uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it seems to me, perhaps, that it might have been inconceivable back in 1989 that 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we would still be in a situation where there are across the world today something like 26 million people internally displaced within their own countries as a result of conflict. There are something like 300,000 child soldiers, many of them forcibly uh, recruited into uh, armies or into uh, situations that I think most of us could, couldn't really imagine uh, in, in our lives, uh, where hundreds of thousands of women still face rape and assault of other forms uh, and as a result of either civil war conflicts or guerrilla conflicts or cross-border conflicts throughout the world. And where each country that is involved in a war or a conflict loses not just something like about 50 million US dollars uh, but also loses something like 20 years in development. Uh, and I think those statistics show perhaps, uh, beyond of course the, the death and the destruction that goes along with conflict, the impact on individuals and on people and communities and on countries uh, of conflicts, which I think perhaps 20 years ago we might not have anticipated would still be happening to the same extent. Uh, the, the other thing that I th the thing that has particularly changed though, I think over that 20 years is that the nature of conflicts has moved on. No longer are most conflicts about either uh, movement of borders, the capture of land uh, from a, a state on the other side of your existing border, or for that matter, about the uh, power blocks that then dominated the world. But more and more conflicts today are about uh, religion, ethnic divides, about power within a country, uh, between uh, individuals who seek that power, uh, or old tensions that have perhaps been released. And in those situations, it is clear that peace agreements, which may in the past or, 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 uh, have been easier described as victories for one side over the other, uh, but peace agreements perhaps in the, in the modern world, uh, peace agreements are not enough to sustain peace and to resolve those conflicts. We need to also deal with the causes of the conflicts as well. And that makes reconstruction and development in a post-conflict situation absolutely vital. It also makes, and this is, this is my central point here uh, this evening, conversely, it makes, for me at least, conflict prevention and the building of sustainable peace by far the greatest and the toughest development channel challenge of these early years of the 21st century. On the positive side, I, I, I think there are signals of, that can give us some real hope. Uh, first of all, I think the existence of, the continued existence of, and success of the European Union, for all its imperfections, uh, the, and the role that it increasingly plays throughout the world, I think is a positive. I think the relative peace and increasing integration and, uh, uh, and outward approach of much of Southern and Latin America, I think, is a, is a positive that certainly was not there in the days of the Cold War. Uh, clearly, the election of a new administration in the United States, which is, uh, in principle, and I think already in practice, multilateral in its approach, uh, under not just President Obama, but uh, uh, the people he has appointed around him, at least has the potential to be the first genuinely multilateral American administration, I think, in my lifetime. Um, and fourthly, I think the changes in Africa, moving on from the old organization of African unity to the new African Union, uh, an organization that has a much more proactive role in helping the continent and its individual nations uh, succeed. Uh, I think that is a, is, a, is a fundamental change 
that signals how things could work more successfully in the 21st century. Indeed, already we see, uh, for example, across Africa, uh, the number of state-based and non, in other words, state-to-state -state conflicts or non-state, in other words, civil war uh, type conflicts in Africa, in Africa uh, reduced by about 50% between 1999 and, and 2006. And the number of fatalities from conflict in Africa dropped by about two thirds between 2002 and 2006. And I think that's not in no small part due to the way in which uh, African leaderships, both collectively and individually, uh, have responded to some of the disasters of the 1990s. But still within that context, there is the huge threat, I think, of fragile states. So over a billion people in the world live in weak or fragile states. The number of weak, the number of individual weak states in the world uh, far outnumbers the number of strong, <coughs> stable states. Something like half of the world's poorest people live in states that are fragile in nature. Something like half the world's child and maternal deaths uh, take place in, or occur in states that are defined as fragile. And if you add into that the likely failure for many countries to reach the Millennium Development Goals, the impact of the current financial crisis on international aid and development, the impact of energy challenges and climate change uh, on uh, those fragile states in particular, but the developing world as a whole, uh, and the impact of technological change, which will increasingly allow individuals or very small groups of people to wreak havoc when they want to, rather than need, uh, need large numbers of people involved in individual conflicts or uh, uh, destructive actions. When you add those factors in, then I think the world well there is hope, there are also still great threats uh, to peace and security for the whole world, but obviously particularly in those fragile states. And I think, uh, and I believe very, very strongly that in an uh, increasingly interdependent and interconnected world, it is the responsibility of all of us, uh, particularly I think here in Europe, given our colonial history, but elsewhere in the world to the responsibility of all of us to develop stable and successful states out of those states that would currently be defined as fragile and potentially unstable. The final point about context that I would want to make is about peacekeeping. There are, uh, many of you will know this already, if you're studying international uh, relations, but there are at the moment 18 peacekeeping missions uh, under the uh, auspices of the United Nations in the world. There are 116,000 personnel committed uh, to those missions. The largest of, largest of which is in the DRC, about 20,000 people uh, serving the Monarch uh, mission there. The total annual cost of those missions uh, for last year was just over 7 billion US dollars. And I have to say that I don't think that is sustainable. Um, and well, I suspect that's probably a view that's held across uh, 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 not just individuals but countries uh, the world over, but that is not sustainable. There seems to me to be a lack of urgency in dealing with the scale of that situation um, and the need to find an alternative way of not just keeping the peace, but building uh, the peace in, in a sustainable way. Which brings me to peace building, and I, 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 I hope we might spark off a bit of discussion uh, this evening uh, on this. Uh, uh, two things in, in advance. First, uh, the whole approach to conflict uh, needs to change. Uh, I know that it is changing in some of the conflicts that, uh, uh, that, that exist and, and perhaps dominate our news media today, but uh, the whole approach to conflict, uh, to mix the military uh, intervention with civilian development interventions far, in a far more integrated fashion, um, that seems to me to be a, a, a basic change that needs to, be, uh, needs to happen uh, with more urgency and with more commitment uh, on the, particularly on the part of those uh, who, in, 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 the, in the developed world, who contribute uh, most to some of the largest conflicts in the world. Uh, but secondly, also prevention uh, it has to be uh, has to be better um, than responding to conflicts that have already erupted or to uh, uh, managing the peace. And in relation to prevention, it seems to me that uh, the role of of mediation. Uh, the, the role of early warning systems as part of a global, uh, a global approach, the management of natural resources 
in a transparent and equitable manager, uh, manner. And having as much of those three things done at the regional level or the continental level rather than the global level uh, would seem to me to be, uh, to be prerequisites uh, of building more sustainable peace in more parts of the world. But I do think that the world can do so much better uh, in relation to supporting countries that are coming out of conflict and want to build a sustainable peace. Uh, there are countless examples, and, and this year alone, I think I have now visited 12 different countries that might be described in some way as post-conflict. And each and every one of them, I found international agencies uh, who talk a good game, but do not cooperate together behind one strategy. Uh, I found delays in finance and personnel that held up vital projects and created disillusionment and increased tension on the ground. I, 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 I and I'm sure others in this room will have seen this before, uh, I've seen egos come in front of sensible decision making and uh, working together. And I think there are really big changes required in the international response uh, to post-conflict reconstruction. Uh, we need to build strong institutions in countries that are coming out of conflict. And that means both strong civic institutions as well as strong government and elected democratic government institutions. It means strong institutions for the delivery of services uh, and uh, rights for people as well as important neutral institutions uh, for the, the delivery of justice in post-conflict countries. Only by doing that uh, will we improve the current situation where something like a third of conflicts that come to an end with a peace agreement re-emerge into conflict again within five years. I think there are five key elements uh, of this. The first is to make sure that uh, we can help create uh, and develop independent, trusted and well-trained justice and security services. The second, uh, and I think this is overlooked on too many occasions, the second would be to ensure uh, that we provide the advice and support that might help create uh, successful taxation, revenue and customs organisations and, uh, and systems. The third would be to support economic development, particularly early rapid economic development, so that there is a jobs dividend, an immediate dividend for people in the peace, which would stop them being tempted perhaps to go back into conflict. The fourth would be to support elections, strong parliaments that operate democratically and transparently, uh, and I think increasingly in strong local government, uh, elected local government too. And the fifth, and of course absolutely vital element in all of this, uh, improved public services, particularly in education, but also in health and clean water and the other uh, essentials of life. In each of these areas, the international community currently has a variety of organisations and agencies with responsibility, in addition to the NGOs and donor countries who make their contribution as well. And if you go into any of the post-conflict countries, particularly in Africa, and ask people direct questions, for example, in one country in sub-Saharan Africa this year where I had the head of the World Bank in the country and the head of the United Nations in the country around the same lunch table and asked them if I was the president of that country and wanted to improve the coordinated response by all the agencies, which of them I would phone first as the most senior and the person in charge and they both almost left the table uh, because they didn't even want to look at the question, never mind uh, hear the question, never mind try and answer it. Uh, the uh, response of those international agencies lets people down again and again and again. And example after example of international agencies supporting, on the one hand, capacity building projects in uh, financial, public financial management, and then, and then paying other people to come in from other countries to monitor their projects in country rather than support the development of the capacity for public financial management in that country uh, itself. So, and in all of these different areas, I think the global response is not yet good enough and could be an awful lot better. And uh, I think that that needs four things, but they all require, I think, a stronger global leadership on this. 
Uh, uh, you know, there's an interesting debate taking place in Europe just now about whether we have a strong leader for the European Council uh, or someone who would take more of a back seat and coordinate the strong uh, national leaders. Uh, that debate doesn't seem to me to take place on the global level, uh, but the kind of leadership, not just at the United Nations, but in other international agencies is required um, to deliver the kind of change and working together an in-country approach that, uh, that is required. And I believe very strongly a change in the balance between peacekeeping and peace building. Uh, one is simply uh, an endless use of resources uh, uh, for missions that in many cases have now gone on for decades. Uh, the other could be uh, the decisive change at the start of this century uh, that helps us avoid that sort of commitment to peacekeeping in the future. To achieve that, I think the four things we need are, first of all, that the international multilateral agencies and those who support them, uh, the donors, uh, need to accept more responsibility and agree clearly who is in the lead in individual countries in post-conflict reconstruction. And I think also those who enjoy the rhetoric of independence from the developed world, uh, 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 but I, and I think in that, in, in that situation, let down those in countries who need more help. Uh, I think more, people, more of the countries who currently resist the intervention of the United Nations need to accept their responsibility for helping their colleagues in the South uh, out of a situation in which they find themselves. The, the second uh, uh, area is an improvement in the quality of what is actually done. Not just in better coordination, but in clearer strategies built up inside a country, supported by the international community, with real accountability. Who is responsible and what will happen if they fail? Who will make sure that they are held accountable for that waste of resource and letting down the people uh, of those individual post-conflict countries? The third is a speedier response, particularly with money being available more quickly for peace building, but also with the uh, movement of people in to help in a post-conflict situation, uh, a far faster response from the UN and others. And fourthly, uh, and uh, I think critically, the development of a proper system of international capacity to help build capacity inside countries, not to substitute, not to send in people from Europe or the North to substitute for the building of capacity or the development of talent in countries in the South, but the proper support for the building of capacity in country. For example, to go back to that uh, uh, specific of taxation and revenue and customs, organization and services. Um, in Rwanda, they now have a national uh, taxation and revenue authority um, that could organizationally compete with any, uh, in, in my view, in, uh, in the developed world. Um, they, they did it systematically, they did it deliberately, they got help from elsewhere to achieve that. And I think if more post-conflict countries uh, were, were able to do that with the right support, then uh, more of them would find themselves in a position to be able to sustain their peace, but also sustain uh, a growing economy and prosperity in the years to come. So I think the delivery of international capacity, particularly from neighboring states, particularly from south, <coughs> countries in the south to other countries in the south, but wider afield as well, uh, del delivering that in a more effective way, I think is fundamental. So those are the four specifics that I think are required. That's the context that I think we operate in. I think if we could get this right, or at least make significant improvements in it, then the phrase world without walls might mean uh, an awful lot more outside of uh, Europe than perhaps it does for some people in some countries um, today. Uh, I think it requires, as I think the last speaker said in a slightly different context, uh, it needs organisations and agencies, it needs leaders, uh, it needs uh, the member states of the United Nations, it needs the officials of the international agencies to operate out with their own walls, uh, to work with others more effectively, to do that in a way uh, that makes a real difference. If they do that, then I genuinely believe that the young people who live in post countries, young people who have grown up, as for example in Liberia, uh, where youngsters there grew up for 15 years without an education system, without schools to go to, youngsters who have grown up in the most horrific conditions, uh, that those youngsters 
can have a future ahead of them which will not have walls but also will not have ceilings and will give them the opportunity to realise their potential and be all that they can be. Thank you.